Um, I'm honored to be here because uh, I have a daughter who is in high school, and uh, for her, I'm only allowed about 100 yards away from our high school. Uh, she won't let me get clo any closer than that. So it's a real honor to be actually let inside a high school-like uh, setting. Um, uh, about eight years ago, I created this video. Great. So I can't actually believe anybody from high school is here on a Saturday, so I thought I'd try to make it as fun as possible. So maybe to get started, um, anybody, can anybody name me the movie and the, the actual word that they said in that movie? Uh, raise your hand. I have really bad vision, and I'll warn you right now, if you're in the back, you should have sat in the front because I can't really see you, but I see a hand right there. What, what movie? Plastic. So you win the first prize of the day. Pass that, that back to that. So pass that on back. So. So. Um, so I didn't know what I wanted to talk to you about today. So I actually went to a high school and I filmed a bunch of high school kids and I asked them if a scientist came to your school, what would you want them to tell you? And, and this is what they told me. So you kind of got the idea. <laughs> so you guys look dorky, not me in that, right? So what I thought I would do is take a, about the next 30 to 40 minutes and tell you a couple of those different things. Tell you who I am, uh, how, uh, how you go about actually creating a company from scratch, um, how you can actually make money in science, um, a couple of aha moments, and you'll see what I mean by that, that I've had in my career when I saw really cool science. And then uh, the lessons that I've learned, and I'm going to tell you about all the mistakes that I've made in going about this. Uh, and then finally, open it up for Q&A. So th I hope that's what you'd like to hear, because that's what I'm going to tell you about. Um, so myself, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, uh, uh, an urban type environment in, in New York City. Uh, very early on, I thought I wanted to be a captain of industry. Um, my father was a retail stockbroker. Anybody here's parents stockbrokers by any chance? Uh, well, uh, so my life was always boom and bust. In fact, this was my father's uh, license plate. Can anybody figure out what that says? Bet it all. Uh, so often he made really bad bets. Uh, and. Um, and this is an article that was out in the New York Times when I, was in a, when I was in high school. And you can see me in there in the way background. I didn't want to be anywhere near a newspaper back then. Uh, but it showed it told about how our family was having all sorts of economic problems. 
But we also had boom times, and this is where I grew up uh, in Chappaqua, New York. Um, can anybody here name a famous person that lives in Chappaqua, New York? Do I see a hand back there? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Prize number two. Pass that back, okay? Um, I, I went to high school uh, also in Chappaqua. Um, I, I, won't, I won't hand out any more prizes if your voices don't come down, because I hate challenging against them. I went to high school also in Chappaqua, and it was a unique high school. Anybody here go to any of the high-tech highs in, uh, you, you do? It, so uh, Horace Greeley was a unique high school. It was very project-based learning. Uh, and that was, I really got excited for the first time about high school then. And one of the things that I did was I got to uh, work with a company, a local company in the area, making the first artificial heart. Uh, this is actually an artificial heart for a cow. Uh, and I did that as a high school student. And it was just so much fun to see this little startup company working on this. Uh, and that's what really got me first excited about science, seeing it actually in the real world. And I'll show you that if you'd like to come up afterwards how that heart works compared to the way they do today. Um, well, that was my show and tell. Um, uh, this was my, do you call them dot dots, your little quotes in the yearbooks? That's what my kids call them. This was my quote in my yearbook. It was actually about Christopher Columbus, and it said, when he left, he didn't know where he was going. When he got there, he didn't know where he'd been. When he got back, he didn't know where he'd come from, and he did it all with someone else's money. <laughs> and, and that's when I first, that was the first inkling that I had that I was going to be an entrepreneur, um, uh, looking back at that particular time. Um, I was, I was really good at school. I wasn't particularly good on standardized tests, as you can see by solving for X uh, there. Uh, and as a result of that, when the, um, when the results for um, your applications came in, the came in the mail, I got a lot of these size ones, the really thin envelope. Um, anybody here applying for college right now? Well, I got lots and lots of those thin envelopes. And it was only because one of the colleges uh, I got in on the waiting list uh, because they didn't accept SAT scores. Uh, so I'm a, a person who can't stand SATs or standardized testing. Um, I, I don't think they measure anything. Um, uh, I did graduate from college. I graduated summa cum laude. Uh, I was headed, I was a pre-med in college. And um, unfortunately, um, the medical schools had a different motion. They thought I should be pre-real estate instead of pre-med. Um, and so when I applied to medical schools, I got about the same number of such rejections. In fact, I got a few more. I did it a, few, a couple of different years. Um, uh, so I said, well, maybe this wasn't the route I was going to go down. And I was getting a little bit discouraged. Um, and, uh, and that's when really, truly, God had his hand on my shoulder. And I can say that because the Dalai Lama is next door. Um, and something amazing happened that I didn't realize the value of, uh, and that was I landed a job uh, at an early stage company with just 50 people in San Francisco that I didn't know anything about um, uh, called Genentech. Anybody know anything about Genentech? Uh, it's it was the first biotechnology company. Um, I was about the 50th employee. I was there for about four years. Uh, when I left, it had well over 1,000 employees. The average age was about 26 years old. You couldn't go into an environment any more fun than that. You'd work all day, but you had fun working all the time. And that's where I first saw what a startup environment really looked like. Even though I wasn't there at the beginning, I got to see it at the very early stages in this really rapid growth and a group of people that were brought together to solve a mission that if you look back in retrospect, you would have said, don't bet your money on this. This will never, ever happen. Uh, but because you had all these really committed people to do it, they didn't have those blinders on. And they went full force to try to do that. So that's when I got my first uh, introduction to um, science. I wasn't very good in the lab. Um, and, and that's when it said to me, and that's a real picture, that I, uh, I should probably, I left the gel running all night. Um, I probably should not be taking up science as my full-time career, so I decided to go into business school uh, because I really liked... Oh, back then, 
it wasn't really, if you were in science and you said you were going to go into business, that was really bad news. You know, if you told any academic, uh, hey, I'm thinking of taking my science knowledge and going into business, you, everybody said that, that's a terrible thing to do. Nowadays, it's much more socially uh, good, uh, uh, and, but, I, but it was a great opportunity to combine both science knowledge and business knowledge together. Um, and I also uh, met very early in my career what I would call a mentor. Does anybody have a mentor or an intern or something like that? This is a really important thing for you to do and hook up with right now, is to find somebody that will take you and show you the ropes uh, and do it for free because they've been through it once before. I met what my future partner to be. I thought, wow, this guy was the coolest guy in the world because he was about 50 years old, but he had this really young uh, wife. And I thought, wow, I want to be like him. Uh, uh, I learned all the business I did from him, but I didn't really, um, I didn't accomplish the other part. Well, my wife's not here. She, we can't tape it anymore. I'm sorry. Um, and then for the last uh, 25 years, what I've spent doing is focusing on doing absolute raw startups, pure concept-based startups from scratch. I've been involved in about 40 startups, 17 of which I proactively created from scratch. Um, and I'm proud to report that as of right now, I've never had a failure. Every single one of them have returned to their investors uh, at least 10 times the money that they put in uh, to the original company. And these are some of the, uh, for each of those companies that was behind those logos, here's what the investors got back uh, in those companies. So they range anywhere from $50 million up to about $15 billion. So that's, that's a little bit about myself. Uh, I guess the conclusion here is you don't have to be really smart to do what I do. So um, this is me about a year ago. I took about two years off. I took my family to Europe, and I thought it'd be really fun to get into this can cannon in Edinburgh, and then I couldn't get out. Um, <laughs> and I, I tried to explain to them that they really should consider cutting the 600-year-old cannon uh, to get me out, but that was not acceptable. Fortunately, I did slip out eventually. But So that's a little bit about myself. I'd like to change gears completely and tell you about what it takes to start up a company in the sciences. What's the typical process uh, out there? People often ask me, oh, is there a formula? And yes, I actually have a formula. There's probably a million different formulas out there, but I have a very specific formula. So I'm going to tell you what my formula for starting up companies is. And I usually start with a really big idea. You know, I'm going to use a sort of an analogy here, kind of a big bang. And uh, going back about eight years ago, I'm going to talk about one, one of the last companies, a nanotech company uh, that I was involved in with Paul, um, uh, because this is a nano high. It's not my favorite one, but it's a good example. So I saw this about eight years ago uh, in a newspaper. Uh, uh, this is uh, former President Clinton's scientific advisor, and he said the area of science that will most profoundly that will affect your future will be nanoscale engineering. I had no idea what nanoscale engineering is. I'd spent most of my, uh, uh, most of my life in um, biotechnology, and this was, all the words were completely new to me. So I had to go and literally start from scratch. And my process is I literally explore the universe. So I'll spend about a year uh, going all around the world talking to every major leader in the field. Uh, uh, of nanotechnology, and I'll ask them, hey, where do you think the big ideas are, and who do you think are the, the other big leaders that I should be talking to? Uh, and through that, what I'll do is I'll develop kind of a database. Uh, and here's the actual database for that nano company. I pulled it up, and at the time, before the time I actually started the company, I talked to, what, about 2, 000, over 2,000 uh, people in the field uh, to figure out where they thought the big ideas were in the field. And then, uh, from that, I tried to find a, a habitable, habitable planet. Um, and for me, what I discovered was that this area of inorganic uh, semiconductor nanoparticles was really, really unique. Uh, most of the world at that point was working on organic nanotechnology, things like carbon nanotubes. And there were a few labs, just a handful of labs, that were working in this space of inorganic nanotechnology. And what was amazing to me and what was the aha moment was that they could do with these inorganic materials far more than the hundreds of other labs doing in the organic 
area because they had this exquisite control over the properties and the growth of these nanoparticles. And I thought that was, it. That was a really unique opportunity. So the first thing I did was I sort of set up a base camp uh, with one of those scientists, uh, a guy named Charlie Lieber at Harvard University, uh, because he had a set of intellectual property that I thought would allow us to get really started in that area. And the typical thing I then do is try to figure out how do you capture the high ground in the field? How do you get out the noise of the 100 other startups in an area? And what I did was I went around the world and I literally licensed all the key uh, intellectual property in this field of nanotechnology from the leading universities. Any one of you can do this. There is just tons of work going on in these universities that's available for license. The only thing that you need to have to be able to do this is extreme patience uh, because these universities are ultra slow and so forth in doing this. But you can get this technology almost for a nickel. Um, uh, in fact, I ended up licensing about 120 patents for less than a cumulative value of about $40,000 uh, to this uh, key intellectual property. I then uh, went in out and hired the, found the expedition team. So what I did was I pulled together with Charlie Lieber the seven other people that I felt would allow you to sort of capture the high ground in the field. And these were the seven individuals that had probably been responsible for over 80% of the key developments in this field of inorganic semiconductor nanomaterials. But you don't have a company until you hire the full-time people, the Sherpas, who are going to do all the heavy lifting. And there's a venture capital dictum that says that you want to hire people that have done it once before with someone else's money successfully. Well, in nanotechnology at that time, it was such a new field, there weren't any people who had successfully done it before. So what I did is I looked for people that had previously successfully commercialized a brand new technology. You'll see shortly, in retrospect, that wasn't the best idea. What I probably should have done is gotten the, be the best young people in the field uh, to do it, but this was the approach that I did, took at the time. I then went out and raised financing uh, for my first, my first round of financing from traditional venture sources. One of the things I realized very early on uh, that has become very true is that nanotechnology takes a lot of money. Uh, just to open up the labs and do the first experiment, you need about $3 million worth of capital equipment. So I went out and I raised a very small amount of money, about a million dollars, and I went out and I got five of the largest venture funds in the country to each put in $200,000 to take sort of a bet on this. In the back of my mind, I knew they weren't going to waste their time putting in $200,000 each. They wanted to put five to $10 million to work. But once I got them to buy into the process, it then became very easy to raise the subsequent rounds of financing. And during the part time when I was part of Nanosys, we raised about $120 million uh, in total capital to do it. The other thing that I realized very early on, and I hope I don't insult anybody in the room when I show you this, is that unlike biotechnology, in nanotechnology, when you see a journal and somebody does an experiment uh, and they get a device to work, you'll see that device and it'll have these perfect characteristics. And what, what really we discovered is that each of these, these scientists, these academic scientists, they could make one device out of 1,000 work, but they never understood why the other 999 didn't work. Um, in a company, you have to do the opposite. You have to figure, make all 100 and other 999 work um, you know, before you actually would have a product. So uh, that was going to be a real challenge. So one of the other things that we did was we went to the government to give us some additional money to help us finance this expedition because venture capital does not like spending money on very um, fundamental research. So we needed some other money to help us support that applied research. Um, well, we started working on our first few product ideas and the first one did not work. Uh, we started working on what were called nanowire sensors uh, and we could not reproduce the work that was going on in the academic lab. We spent about $6 million uh, trying to reproduce it. We actually had people in our lab from that lab, and no matter what we did, we could not reproduce that work. Um, we went back to the university and said, hey, you got to credit us because they, the clock was ticking. 
Um, you know, you got to credit us because we couldn't reproduce it. And the university said, tough luck on you, it does work. And even though they would never allow us to come into the university and see it work. But this is the type of thing that happens when you do a startup. Uh, so we focused on a bunch of different app, other different applications. And we did get a lot of other things to work. And the good news was things were starting to look really good. And we were heading on our final ascent to the pinnacle uh, of our journey. This, uh, this article, we filed for an IPO, and just before we filed for an IPO, this article came out that said that the next biggest uh, IPO other than Google this summer will be a small company called Nanosys. We were so excited. Things were just going great, perfectly. Um, and then we hit a blizzard. Um, and anybody know who this guy is in the lower right? Without reading, anybody did know? This is the biggest putz in the world. Um, so we're just about to do our IPO, uh, and this guy comes out and he gives a conference. He's, his name is Vinod Kosla. He's one of the most famous venture capitalists in the world. And he gets up in front of a public conference and he says, this company Nanosys is trying to perpetuate a fraud on the world. Uh, and interest in our IPO roadshow dried up, just solid dead. He retracted that statement a day later. Uh, he'd never been to the company, never even read our IPO prospectus. He never met any of the management. But because he had so much credibility out there, it just killed our IPO roadshow. We spent, in fact, we spent about $3 million trying to put that roadshow together, uh, and that just died on the next day. Um, and um, so what we did is we had to go back to the village to pray for a little while and figure out what we're going to do next. Um, so that company is still in process. I don't know what, where it is uh, and, uh, at this stage because I'm not involved on a day-to-day -day basis anymore. But I thought I would try to express what could possibly happen through some nano art. Uh, so there's two possibilities. Um, here's a nano smile face. Um, but there's also uh, a nano toilet. So, so those are the two possibilities. But that's sort of the anatomy of one startup. But it pretty much follows the pathway of what you might see through a lot of different companies that I've been involved with, uh, not the toilet part. Uh, so um, I'm going to change gears again and talk about how do you become wealthy uh, utilizing science and venture capital and startups. Um, if you were going out to go get a job, I'm um, curious, how would you like to be compensated? What would, what would be the main elements of being compensated? So I see a hand anywhere? Hand? No? How would you, what would be the key things you'd like to, anybody? Uh, oh, what? Money? Okay, but salary, I take it. Anything else? How, how do you want to, when you get your job, what, what are the key, what? Benefits? Benefits? Anything else? Okay. Insurance. Insurance. Easy work. Easy work. Okay. Well, uh, those are not. Those are all the ones. You, in fact, you mentioned those salary benefits. Uh, you know, insurance, uh, things like that. If you want to make money in science, forget all the top ones. There's only two things: uh, work environment and stock options or equity or sweat equity. Uh, those are the only two ways you can make money uh, in science. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about how you do that. I gave uh, to a group of kids that came in, a, a group back here in the uh, lower, in the second to la last row of the first section. I asked them if they were starting up a company uh, and they had a CEO, uh, a chief financial off a CEO, a chief executive officer, a chief financial officer, a vice president of R&D, uh, an uh, inventor, and, and then they also needed a bunch of other employees. How many shares out of 100 shares would they give to each of those different people? And what they told me was that they would give the CEO 25 shares, the CFO 20 shares, uh, the VP of R&D 20 shares, the inventor of the technology 10 shares, and they would have 25 shares rest for, for all the rest of the employees. Uh, and that's a pretty good guess. Uh, they got, gave me that answer pretty quickly, though this, this coming up, figuring this out among these people could take the longest part in the company. Um, so uh, here's actually, I, I averaged out all the companies I've been involved in 
to see what, what they actually were. And uh, the legend is in the upper right. But basically, uh, the inventor gets the lion's share of the equity. So completely opposite to what these guys said. Uh, the CEO, he probably gets the next largest. He gets about 20% uh, uh, of, uh, of the company. Uh, the CFO, uh, which they had up here as one of the highest, he gets the least. He's just a financial guy. He just does numbers. He doesn't add a real lot of value to the thing. And then uh, the VP of R&D uh, has something pretty close to what the CEO has. And in most of these companies, the VP of R&D is also the inventor. So if you add those together as a percentage, um, they, they have by far the largest share of the company. So it's the scientist in the bottom line is the one who makes the most uh, out of these companies. So you start out with that. You start out with 100 shares. You divide it up, as I'm sort of showing you here. Uh, and then you go out and raise around the financing. And I'm going to show you a set of slides that's so simple, but I've met National Academy members that don't understand this. Um, so, uh, so let's say you go out and you raise around the financing. Uh, and you say, hey, here's our idea. Here's our team. Um, investors, we want you to invest in the company. We want to raise $5 million. Um, uh, the investors say, hey, I think that company is worth $5 million before I put my money in. So if I give you $5 million, how much is the company now worth? $10 million? Uh, so they get half the company for that $10 million. So now the company is worth a lot more, but everybody's share has been split in half. Does everybody get that? Uh, so now uh, you go and you raise another round of financing. Uh, and let's say now, I actually I can't read that. I say, let's say you're raising, raising a now $50 million because things are going really well and you're going to give away half the company again. Well, once again, everybody gets kind of cut in half except for the investors who get more. Uh, uh, so everybody's got a lower and smaller and smaller piece of the pie. But if you follow just one of those people all the way across, you can see their value is going up and up and up uh, over that. And that's called sweat equity. That's uh, there's no way in two to three years you're ever going to get with a salary the amount of value that you're going to increase with the sweat equity in a company. Uh, and this is pretty much that's happened to me for every single one of the companies that I've been involved with. You get that sweat equity, you pay a tenth of a penny a share for it. A few late years later, you're selling that for $10 a share in an IPO. And a couple of years after that, after the company's gone public, you're you know, it's worth even much more. I had a company, one of the more recent companies I did, Illumina. I paid for my shares a tenth of a penny a share, and uh, uh, it's about a 10-year-old company now. They sell for the equivalent of about $80 to $100 a share. So there's all the value that you create is never from salary. You'll never in your life be able to make that much salary in such a short period of time. You'll never be able to get the benefits equivalent of what you can from this sweat equity. So. Um, to test, test to see if you have been listening to me. So let's say you were starting up a company, you own 20% of that company, and you went out and raised uh, $20 million at a $60 million pre-money valuation. Uh, how, much how much percentage of the company do you think you would own afterwards? Anybody? How much? What percentage? So you've gone from 20% to what percent? Anybody for a prize? 15? 50. 50. Well, you, went, you, you raised more money, so you had to go down. Five. What? 15? Uh, I don't think you get, I think you see, now you've got to go home. This is where you got to be smarter than a national. No, I'm not giving any prizes out. This one, I didn't hear it once. It once. So, but maybe I'll start. I'll, I'll simplify it for you a little bit. Would you rather have 100% of a small piece of pie, of a pie, or would you rather have 1% of a giant pie? Which would you rather have? Okay, I think I heard that person say 1% of a giant pie. So, I'll give you that game. <laughs> Okay, so um, 
so I, I've talked about what my formula is for creating companies. I've also talked about um, how do you make money uh, in startups. Uh, what I thought I would uh, uh, conclude with are two things. Uh, what were the aha moments in these different companies that I saw that, that made me think, oh, gee, this was an area around which to create a company? Uh, and first, before I do that, I'll, I'll just tell you where these ideas usually come from. Uh, they come from a different, a variety of different things. One of them is reading, 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 and reading fundamental uh, research. Um, I have never in my entire life read the Wall Street Journal. If there's an idea in the Wall Street Journal, uh, it's already five years too late to execute on that idea. The only way you're going to get a brand new idea is by reading the very fundamental research. So that's the first uh, genesis of the ideas. The second are just looking at industry trends. Um, you know, you look at what other companies are being started up in the area and what, what other venture VCs are funding. Because VCs don't like to fund things that are very far out of the trends that are ongoing right at that moment. A third area for the genesis of these ideas is networking. Just talking to lots and lots and lots of different people. I guarantee you, if you pick an area to focus a company, start a company in, and you talk to a lot of different people, you will have gotten the idea of where to create that company within about 100 conversations. Uh, the next way of finding a company is to copy somebody else's idea or improve upon it. There are a lot of people starting up great companies' ideas. You could go to Kleiner Perkins' website, see what companies they're funding. I guarantee they've got the, some of the best ideas there, but they funded something that wasn't so great. So the best thing to do is look at what somebody else is doing and copy and improve upon it. And I'll show you an example of that. So those are the big, those are the big ways of, uh, that I come up with starting up companies. So what I thought is I'd give about seven examples of companies that I've been involved with, some of the ones that I've thought have been the most fun, but um, uh, just to give you some examples. Well the, well, the first one is nanotechnology, and I, I told you about the history of that company, but the thing that I saw that was the aha moment was pretty much what you see here. It actually looked more, it looked more like this at the time. Where did that go? Uh, it looked more like this at the time, you know, not quite as bright and as there. But what this, the aha here was that for the, uh, does ever, anybody seen this before? You know, can somebody tell me what it is? For a prize? A Sci San Diego Science Festival t-shirt? Right, anybody? Well, I don't see anybody, okay. Oh, okay, go ahead, I can't see up there, so yell it out. They're quantum dots, which are these microscopic little uh, spheres that, when stimulated, emit a certain frequency of radiation by a quantum mechanical Wow, Whoa, give him this. I'm gonna give you some quantum dots, okay? And, and I'd like your business card afterwards so I could talk to you about my next startup. Um, well, actually, so the aha here for me was that uh, for the first time, you could independently control a material's functional properties from its physical properties. So as, as the person mentioned, uh, each of these vials contain the exact same material in them. The only difference is in the first vial, all the particles are two nanometers in size. The next one, they're three, then four, then five, then six. So simply by controlling the size, you could fine tune a material's functional properties. And what that meant was that, oh, I should, did just show and tell, was that, oh, oh another, another chance for a contest. For a t-shirt, did anybody read the slide and see what they were made out of? Oh, down here? Oh, what, what's that? Okay, I'll give it to you. Cadmium selenide, but I, I do appreciate you reading the slides and paying attention. It was right there. No. Okay. So what, what this, you know, in, a real, in my simplistic way of looking at things, what this really meant to me is it changed the world from when, one where uh, basically you had a switch 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose this material because it has exactly this property, or I can't use that material, to one where you basically have a dial. I'm gonna dial into the material exactly the properties that I want it to have. Uh, and that really meant that you've taken the world that we've all been accustomed to, where you basically had the periodic table, I'm gonna select properties out of the periodic table, to one where you basically, the periodic table almost becomes three-dimensional. For every single one of the elements, you have multiple different properties that you can draw from. And that was the aha moment um, in, uh, in this area of nanotechnology that said this was the right time to form it. Another one of the properties that you could change besides their functional properties were things like their shape. So you could make very simple things like uh, we just talked about, like little dots, but you could also make things like rods and wires and ribbons, or you can make very complicated structures like you see in the middle there or on the, on the right thing, like little tetrapods. Um, uh, this is what a little tetrapod looks like. You know, it's kind of like a little kid's jack. Um, can anybody think, or I know, I know you've heard this from one of your other talks, why would you want to make something that's the shape of a tetrapod? But, Raise your hand, really, really, really. Oh, I see somebody here. Um, it's, like really it's what? It's like a stable, structure. stable, okay. Give me an, anybody else? It's really stable. It's really stable. <laughs> okay. Well, the really nice thing about these structures is no matter how you apply them to a surface, they always have one leg sticking up. So when you want to go to interface to them, it's very easy if you have an electrode on the bottom and an electrode you want on the top, they always face the same way. Uh, so it's very easy to interface to them. Uh, so I'm gonna give this young lady a shirt for the st stability answer. Okay? The other thing with these materials that was sort of an aha thing was that you could combine within one nanostructure two or more different materials. And what that meant was that for the first time, these materials actually became devices because you could bring two or more different materials together. So it was no longer a material, it was now an active device, uh, in this case a transistor. Uh, and I mentioned that I would tell you about some cool, mo or those kids asked for what were some cool moments that you got as a result of starting these companies. One of the things I got to do was um, go uh, to the Oval Office to see the signing of the uh, first nanotechnology uh, uh, bill, uh, and I didn't think anybody would believe me because before we went to that meeting, I got the opportunity to meet George Tennant. Anybody know who George Tennant is? Uh, anybody? He was the former head of the CIA, and I sat, we, we were having lunch with him, and he said, um, do you, he said, Mr. Bach, do you think you could sneak nanotechnology into the airport, through an airport? And I said, no problem. I, I definitely think you could sneak nanotechnology through the airport. He goes, no, 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 you're all wrong. You know, after 9-11, we've got that all figured out. You can't, you can't bring nanotechnology through the airport. And I said, well, I beg to differ. Um, I've actually brought some nano devices here into CIA headquarters. And he got really a little bit mad. And he goes, well, you, that's not even the highest level of security. So I didn't want to be outdone. So I brought the nanotechnology to the Oval Office. Uh, and nobody said anything. And, and just to get full proof, I went into the Oval Office bathroom, you know, took a picture of my nanotechnology there. And, and I knew people wouldn't believe me, so I stole the toilet paper with the presidential seal on it. So, so yes, you can sneak nanotechnology through the airports. So that was a fun moment uh, in my life. Um, I'll change gear to some other uh, aha moments that I had in companies that I was involved in. Um, in your lifetime, uh, and my lifetime, what do you think has been the, the single most important technology trajectory of your lifetime? Yeah, what about computers? Transistors. Transistors, okay. So, uh, uh, miniaturization. So let's give that person who said transistors a t-shirt. Okay. Okay. So, um, so the, the the trajectory is miniaturization. Uh, if you didn't know about transistors, uh, you could see it other ways. 
Um, now, I've been to a lot of high schools, and most kids actually don't even know about this process. So I, I went on the internet and brought a few examples. So this is pretty much just kind of when I, a little bit before I was born. This is what a transistor looked like. Uh, this is a single transistor. You know, a few years later, this is what it looked like. So there basically were about 100 of these in one of these. A few years after that, there were about 100 of these in one of these little chips. A few years after that, there were about 1,000 of these in one of these. So these, these components have been shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Things have been miniaturized, uh, and then they've been integrated one after another. So that's a technology trajectory that's happened two times in my lifetime, one in microelectronics, the other one in an area called MEMS. Anybody know what MEMS is? Do I see any hands? No? Microelectromechanical systems. These are miniaturizing components to actually like make little mechanical objects. If you have a projector like the one back there, it actually has little tiny mirrors uh, manufactured through the same technology on it to miniaturize little tiny mirrors on it. So these are two technology directories that I saw in my lifetime. And um, I did the show and tell. And I, I uh, oh, do you know why kids wear pants like this? Because if an iPod had a transistor this size, that's how big, that's how low their pants would be, you know, going. So, uh, so, so, so one of the other areas that I, I stumbled upon a, a miniaturization like this was not in electronics or mechanical parts, but was actually in fluid movement. Um, and I saw, I was in a researcher's lab, and I saw this simple little structure here, a piece of glass, and as you can see, it's got a tiny little channel scratched in it, you know, with an inter two channels intersecting with each other. And the aha moment that I saw, and this is a company that made me, myself, $37 million, just seeing this little slide, was this little video here. So what you're doing is we're looking down a microscope at the intersection of those two different channels. And, and that's the intersection where that, that green is sort of intersecting. And if I play the video, you'll see that you've got fluid moving down, uh, and this fluid actually had DNA in it. And in a very few seconds, you can pinch off a little bit of that fluid at the intersection and run it down a column and separate the DNA. So the aha moment there was, and I'm gonna play that one more time, um, uh, is, let's see if this works, is that at, in that little glass thing up there, at the little wells, you have an electrode in each of those little wells, so you have four electrodes, and they're basically controlling the voltage at that intersection, so that you can just use electricity to basically create an artificial valve uh, and, and pinch off uh, a small amount of that fluid. Uh, that was an aha moment when I saw that, what that meant was that in my lifetime, you know, when I went to school in college, this is how you did chemistry uh, in things like about this size. Then, uh, you know, when I got, first got to Genentech, you kind of did chemistry in little pipettes like this. So you kind of went down a, a factor of about 100 fold. Uh, and then a little bit later, you started using little micro pipettes like this. And then what this technology allowed and I'll pass this around if you guys promise to send it back, is uh, what the technology looks like in this environment. And you can take it and look it up at the light, and you see these tiny little uh, channels in this that are about, don't drop it, so it's worth about $500 million. Uh, uh, these tiny little channels that are a fraction the width of a human hair, and chemistry is being done on it. So this is what was this next sort of big uh, miniaturization area. For those, so what it allowed you to do, the aha was, it allowed you to take the full capabilities of a laboratory and put it on a tiny little microchip. Uh, not just the fluid uh, measuring and stuff like that, but the separations, the sample preparation, filtering, and all other types of capabilities. And this is what the first generation of the technology whoop, uh, looked like. I don't know why that went. Ahead. Uh, this is what the first generation of the technology looked like. Very simple chips that look like the one that over there, but very quickly 
the technology has gotten more and more miniaturized so that you literally have thousands and thousands of these channels all in a, in a very small area on a chip. So a very simple idea was the basis for, I think, a big idea type of company. So that's, um, uh, that's what was the aha moment in that first company. Um, people often ask me, well, why did you start a company focused on miniaturization? And I found this video clip that really describes it best. So that's the difference between a venture capitalist thinks and a, a scientist. So, um, so I'll talk about a couple of other companies. Um, anybody know what a transgenic animal is? Oh, I see a hand back there. It's, it's, it's a, an animal that has its uh, genes taken off just straight from another ant organism and spliced into a genome. Send that kid a t-shirt back there. So, okay. That's exactly right. So about 20 years ago, uh, this was the cover of, what is it, Science Magazine. Uh, these are two different mice. Uh, one of them has the human growth hormone gene uh, put into it, so it's obviously much larger. The other one uh, doesn't. And that was an aha. When I saw that, that seemed like a really aha, incredible technology. Uh, and uh, I also thought I'd show you this. This is a company that got formed out of it, a company called GenFarm, uh, that produced the first transgenic cow about a good uh, 10 years before Dolly the, um, Dolly the sheep. Uh, and so this cow actually has a gene put in it called, uh, tra tra what is it called? Now I'm having a mental block. Uh, trans transferon, uh, lactoferon, sorry. Uh, lactoferon, which is a, um, which is a protein uh, that is required in baby's milk uh, to bind iron, uh, but is very hard to produce. Uh, and what we did was we put that gene so that it was only expressed in the milk of a cow so that you could give a cow's milk to a baby in a third world country and they could get the full benefit of, uh, of, mothers, of, of their own mother's milk. And that's, um, that's the cow, his name is Herman. Uh, and that's, that's her offspring um, as the uh, first transgenic cow. But that's not what made the company successful. It was actually this guy here. Um, this is a mouse, uh, and it's the first mouse that had basically the human immune system put into it so that you could uh, create an antibody inside of a mouse that looked exactly like a human's uh, antibodies. Uh, and that allowed you to do research in the laboratories very quickly. So this company, in a couple of years, we were able to sell for about $200 million because of that mouse. Uh, so that was an aha moment. Uh, in another company I was involved with, how am I doing in time, by the way? Keep going? Okay, tell me. Okay. Uh, anybody know what apoptosis is? Oh, there you go. Uh, you got a prize. So, okay. So um, uh, apoptosis, she said, was programmed cell death. So cells uh, basically die to two different mechanisms. Necrosis, where they get some sort of insult and they die, or they're actually programmed to die. And this is a little video of apoptosis. Uh, and I saw this video, and you'll see this cell in the middle there, and it basically is boiling. You know, it, it's a program process where it goes through this program process of dying and disappearing so that there's no remnants of it left. I've repeated it a couple of times so you can see that. So when I saw that uh, video, uh, it became very clear uh, that what had happened was there now were now some genes that controlled cell death. Um, and I went around the world licensing up all these key cell death genes because they were important because Either in the body, if you had too much cell death or too little cell death, that affected diseases ranging from cancer to ischemia. 
So actually in about a year period, we managed to accumulate all those genes for about $100,000, and then we sold one fraction of that program to a, a pharmaceutical company called Siba Geige for about $80 million. Um, so it's, a, it's very easy to amalgamate this science uh, and do things. But this is kind of one of the more interesting uh, aspects of this technology that I like. This is a, a, a plant that has one of these cell survival or anti-death genes put in it and subjected to drought conditions. And you can see if it has the, has the gene put in it, it survives drought conditions. If it does not, it doesn't. So they're actually putting a human gene into a plant and they confer uh, this survival type characteristic. So on one of those slides, I mentioned one of the cell death genes. Uh, anybody see, name me one of those cell death genes? I see one up there. Uh, somebody else? Yeah? BCL2, yeah. There you go. Um, Another, uh, another company uh, that I want to talk to you about is a good, a good example of copying somebody else's idea. Uh, anybody know about this company? It's a local company here, Amiris. Anybody? This is a company that's engineered yeast uh, to take a biofuel like corn and produce gasoline, real gasoline. So not use yeast to produce ethanol, but actually engineer yeast to be, produce a, bi a biofuel like, uh, like gasoline you can use in a car. That was just a brilliant idea. It was a local venture firm here, Kleiner Perkins, that funded it. Uh, and I, we looked at that area and we thought, well, there's got to be other good ideas like that out there. Um, uh, so I seeded a company called Sapphire Energy that took that idea one step further. They took algae and engineered algae to produce gasoline. So the nice thing about algae is that they are photosynthetic. They fix carbon dioxide, they take carbon dioxide and sunlight and basically create, um, uh, they're engineered to produce gasoline. Uh, and this is real gasoline. In fact, uh, about a month ago, there was a story in the newspaper about a co an accomplishment of this company I'll play you a quick video clip of. I can't believe it didn't get more international attention, but they actually flew uh, a jet. I'm going to cut that off a little short before time. But I thought that was sort of a remarkable thing in terms of a renewable energy source that is basically carbon neutral, uh, uses algae to produce gasoline. A uh, very simple idea was a group of scientists that had that idea, put some seed money in with two other people uh, into this startup. Uh, and in a very short period of time, less than a year, they did that sort of demonstration. So it shows you how quickly you can do things um, in, in science. Another company that I've been involved with is doing something called biologically inspired assembly. Anybody know what a phage is? Bacterial phage? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's a virus that, uh, that attacks bacteria. Five minutes, okay. Uh, I've got only five minutes, so I'm gonna speed up a little bit. So this, this bacteria is used a lot in, in the biotechnology industry because you can evolve it very quickly to recognize very specific surfaces. And what this company did was that it's been mostly used in the pharmaceutical industry. They turned it around and said, how could it be used in the semiconductor industry? Uh, so what they did is they evolved this virus, uh, in, and I won't go through the details of it, uh, so that one part of it recognizes one uh, inorganic material, another part of it recognizes another inorganic material. 
So you can basically uh, coat a surface of a little microchip by dipping it into these little bacteria. Uh, these bacteria assemble on the surface and they pull the ions out of another metal and then coat the metal. You see that little outside layer is coated uh, by tiny little bacteria. If you want to do that in a semiconductor processing environment, you're kind of restricted to something this size um, uh, and it's very expensive to do. Now with this process, you can do it over meter squared areas in a very simplified type process. Um, let's see here. Uh, I'm going to um, skip this company because we're out of time. Um, okay, well this is a company up. Okay, this is a company that probably made me my most money. It's called Illumina. It's also a copy. It, it was a copy of another company here called Affymetrix. Anybody hear of that company? Affymetrix is probably the most brilliant company started up in the last 10 years. Though the, the thing they were trying to do with their technology could be solved much more simply. So what Affymetrix figured out how to do was use semiconductor processing to basically make arrays of DNA on a tiny little chip utilizing photolithography. When, when I saw that, I went around the world asking, could that be done any cheaper uh, than using photolithography, which was really expensive? And I came upon this researcher that had basically taken a little fiber optic bundle. This is what a fiber optic bundle, there are literally thousands and thousands of these little fibers in it. And if you dip it in acid, what happens is you get a little well that forms in the tip of each one of these little bundles. And then you can take little beads in a dish, and you can stick this thing in the beads, and every one of those little wells will get filled up by a little bead. Um, very simple idea. And then what you do is on each of the beads, you synthesize a different piece of DNA. And then you combine them all, and you have this decoding method so that instead of doing all this lithography, all you have to do is synthesize these beads with different materials on it and, and dip it into a well, and they all go into these little things. Uh, and this company now sells about $800 million uh, worth of this equipment uh, per year. It's about a uh, seven-year-old company um, uh, based upon this idea and, you know, looking at what somebody else did. And I, you really know what technology has hit the mainstream. I saw this in uh, Craigslist. Uh, this is a classified personal ad. It's a woman seeking another person without BRAC, being BRAC negative, which is a uh, a gene for, um, uh, for causing cancer. So people are actually getting, utilizing this technology right now to get their whole genome sequence to see if they have things, and they're putting up personal ads to find people that are genetically compatible with them. So that, that's when you really know. Uh, so the last example I'll do uh, is really the ultimate technology, and, and that's uh, life, life extension. So imagine you could go into a, um, you could go into a uh, doctor's office and say, hey, why don't you turn back my life about 10 years? Uh, well, we came across this technology out of Harvard University uh, that took kind of three ideas together. One is you probably heard how red wine is really good for you. Uh, and for some reason, there's this thing called the French paradox that French people can eat this horrible food. Uh, they drink red wine, and they're still as healthy as we are. Uh, uh, so there must be something in red wine. Another phenomena is something called calorie restriction. Turns out if you restrict a, a person's diet, or a mouse's diet in this case, and you lower the amount of calories he, he intakes, you actually can extend his life. So the question was, is there something chemically that could mimic the same process so you didn't have to lower the amount of calories that come in? And the scientists at Harvard uh, found a set of genes that were turned on in this calorie restriction thing, and he went to find, is there a chemical that could start that? And it turned out there was a chemical in red wine that could do that. Um, and this is, um, this is a little segment that appeared on 60 Minutes about two weeks ago about that. I'll only play the first couple of minutes about it. 17 years ago, 60 Minutes first examined the so-called French paradox which suggested that the French, despite a high-fat diet and high consumption of wine, had a remarkably low incidence of heart disease compared with Americans. Most researchers agreed that there was something in the wine that offered protection. And a few years later, even the highly cautious federal dietary guidelines say that moderate consumption of red wine can be beneficial. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the, 
not play that because we're lower in time. Uh, he goes on to say that you know this this chemical uh, resveratrol uh, can actually reverse that same process. And this company went on to find molecules that mimic resveratrol, but were, were were much more potent. And in five years, that company went from a ground startup, and it was bought by GlaxoSmithKline for seven hundred and fifty million dollars in uh, just under five years. Uh, so. Um, I'm going to tell you really quickly about the lessons that I've learned, um, and I'm going to go through these very quickly. It's better to, to start a company on a really big idea than it is to so start a company on a small idea, because it's just as much work. So you might as well target the biggest possible idea uh, that you can be involved with. In. Uh, the second thing that I've learned, really, is you've got to listen very carefully out there. Um, the best entrepreneurs are the ones that listen uh, the most carefully. Um, the first company I was involved with, it took, I went to 150 VCs trying to raise money before I raised my first round of financing because I didn't listen to what the first three or four of them told me uh, would be, they would need to see in order for them to fund it. When I finally listened, I went back to those first three and they funded. So listening is really key uh, to being an entrepreneur. The next thing is hiring people that are smarter than yourself. Um, None of these companies ever succeeds on its first idea or the first thing that it does. So the, be the best thing to do is hire really smart people who can see those things every time you hit a challenge and you can't solve something, they can figure out another way of doing it. Uh, and so you really got to surround yourself with extremely smart people. Uh, the next thing is uh, get bad news quickly. Uh, you know, a lot of scientists, you know, never want to ask the critical question. Uh, and you've got to, in, in an entrepreneurial environment, you've got to ask that question very quickly to get that uh, answer very quickly. Uh, another thing I won't have time to explain is keep it very plain vanilla. Um, and we could talk about this afterwards if you have questions. And then finally,